Greetings and shalom, my friends. Ron Smith here. And uh, listening, of course, to www.sminspire.us. And we're glad to have you. We're looking at the portion that is called Vayachi. Vayachi is the last portion in Genesis. It runs from Genesis chapter 47, verse 28, all the way to the end in chapter 50, verse 26. And we are taking this into three parts this time. And uh, boy, I tell you, these last two portions have just been, there's so much to them, so much. I, I, I can't say enough. I'm, I'm just this kid from Arkansas, you know, but this time we'll be taking a look at the last part and and really actually we're talking about uh well what we would otherwise call the process of death now i'm not wanting to make that a mournful thing here i'm not wanting to put you in gloom or anything like that but we want to really define that and really understand who is alive and who is dead so uh, i'll just begin here at genesis chapter 49 i'll start at verse 28 it says this all these are the tribes, the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is how their father spoke to them and blessed them, giving each his own individual blessing. So we read about that yesterday and it goes on to say, Then he charged them as follows, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my ancestors in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hitti, the cave in the field of Machpelah by Mamri in the land of Canaan, in the land of Canaan, which Avraham bought together with the field from Ephron the Hitti as a burial, burial place belonging to him. We read about this not that long ago. And there they buried Avraham, his wife Sarah, there they buried Yitzhak and his wife Rivka, and there I buried Leah, the field and the cave in it, which was purchased from the sons of hate. When Yaakov had finished charging his sons, he drew his legs up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. Okay, now again, I'm just reading from some notes and making some commentary on them, but really I want to, in all of this, encourage you, poke some chutzpah into you. It may feel good, it may not, but we want to encourage you. Now, I'm going to again talk about a passage that we call death, and going from one realm or reality to another. Israel solemnly and with detail instructs his kids to bury him in the cave of Machpelah and no other place other than that. And from Genesis chapter 48 all the way through where we are here in 49, uh, actually 49 verse 33, all of that time Israel has simply been sitting up in his bed and doing little more than that with his legs hanging over its side. That's where he blessed the two boys and and so forth as he draws his legs uh, as he draws his legs back into his bed he breathes his last breath now scripture then makes a, a very common biblical statement it goes something like this and he was gathered to his people and this is not merely a joining in death this is a joining in life i like to make it a capital l life there there is no burial spoken of in, in his passing while in bed, yet he is at this moment so mentioned as, quote, gathered to his people. That doesn't mean he's buried. That means he passed from one reality to another, and he is gathered with all of those who have gone before him. In 1 Samuel 25, verse 29, Avigail, or Abigail, says to King David, quote, even if someone comes along searching for you and seeking your life, your life will be bound in the bundle of life with Adonai your God. But the lives of your enemies he will fling away as if from the pouch of a slingshot. Unquote. That is to say, the general term death is a little different for the believer than, and the believer and the follower of the Lord who is gathered to his or her people, which is a, a gathering into the bundle of life with Adonai. We, the survivors, speak of death because we are the ones experiencing that. Those passing through the veil are experiencing nothing short of life. 
they're not experiencing death. We are, okay? We are the ones who, if you will, are to some degree dead. Let's read Genesis chapter 51 through 3. It says, Yosef fell on his father's face, wept over him, and kissed him. Then Yosef ordered the physicians in his service to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Yisrael. Forty days were spent at this, the normal amount of time for embalming. Then the Egyptians mourned him. The Egyptians mourned him for seventy days. Wow. Another part of the general word for death is the mourning process. Again, the mourning process is, is experiencing death, likely within the 40 days required for embalming Egypt. Egypt. <laughs> Egypt mourned for Israel for 70 days. Now, the reason why this kind of bum fuzzles me is because they're Egypt is treating Jacob as if he were something not too terribly short of a monarch, even though Yisrael or Jacob is, he's not Egyptian. He's not, he's just passing through that land for 17 years. So this is quite remarkable and really speaks of how much Egypt came to respect this family. This speaks more of the planned or allowed process, which is a good thing. What we read about here in the mourning process is a good thing. Other parts of the process of death and mourning are highlighted in upcoming verses. As for embalming, we, we seek similar results today, so it seems, though whatever's in that piece of chocolate or ice cream of mine may well help out the matter of, uh, of, of a slow, really slow embalming, but nonetheless... <laughs> Uh, we tend to seek uh, similar results today through uh, various chemicals, but the orthodox practice herein is to buy something as close as a pine box as possible or legal and do what may be done to speed the process along, the process of decomposition. Uh, let's read chapter 50, verse 4 through 13. It says, When the period of mourning was over, Yosef addressed... Uh, <coughs> Pardon me, Yosef addressed to the household of Pharaoh, I will I would like to ask a favor. Tell Pharaoh my father had had me swear an oath. He said, I'm going to die. You are to bury me in my grave, my grave which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Therefore I beg you, let me go up and bury my father. I will return. Pharaoh responded, Get up and bury your father, as he made you swear. When they arrived at the threshing floor in Atad, beyond the Yarden, they raised a loud and bitter lamentation, mourning for his father seven days. When the local inhabitants, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on, on the floor of Atad, they said, quote, How bitterly the Egyptians are mourning! Unquote. This is why the place was given the name of El Mitzrayim, or Mourning of Egypt, there beyond the Yarden. His sons did to him as they, as he had ordered them to do. They carried him into the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, which Avraham had bought, along with the field as a burial place belonging to him from Ephron the Hitti by Mamre. Okay, so this is this part of the death process. Death process is the burial with the cave there at the graveside mourning that uh, accompanies that process there. A very large caravan, it says. Uh, all of the leadership of Egypt, that is, with the two chariots with horses, leave from Goshen en route to Machpelah. says they arrived at the threshing floor in Atad, beyond the Yarden. Okay, now this is where I, in all of my study, trying to figure out where Atad is. It's You get into... Uh, various views and people arguing about which side of the Jordan that Atad is and whether it's east or the west side and really honestly it kind of depends on where you're standing you know so if if I am looking at you from one side of a of a river with you looking back at me we're each beyond the side of the same river so the, all of these arguments of what it means to be beyond the river uh, <laughs> It's kind of silly arguments, but anyway, upon noting the great mourning of the Egyptians there, the locals changed the name of the place 
to Avel Mitzrayim, or mourning of Egypt. With Israel lady into the cave of Machpelah, this part of the death process begins to close here. So let's read uh, uh, the next few verses. Isaiah, or Isaiah, why did I say Isaiah? Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. It doth say, Realizing that their father was dead, Yosef's brothers said, Yosef may hate us now, and lay us back in full, pay us back in full for all the suffering we caused him. So they sent a message to Yosef, which said, Your father gave this order before he died. Say to Yosef, I beg you now, I beg you now, please forgive your brother's crime and wickedness and doing you harm. So now we beg you, forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Yosef wept when they spoke to him. And his brothers came, his brothers too came, prostrated themselves before him and said, Here, we are your slaves. But Yosef said to them, Don't be afraid. I Am I in the place of God? You meant to do me harm, but God meant it for good, so that it would come about as it is today with many people's lives being saved. So don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he comforted them, speaking kindly to them. So here we're speaking of a process, the death, the dying and death process, or the death and dying process uh, of getting along after the, the funeral and the burial and so forth is over with, can actually be some of the most difficult. Perhaps uh, too often the cat being gone gives the mice a chance to fight. Yet here we have a you know a better example. If Egypt mourns so heavily in the passing of Israel, how much more would the actual physical family have a, a deep need and responsibility to comfort and speak kindly with one another, allowing all the more time, if necessary, to you know sort things out. Things such as the continued process of grieving and recognition of that need to grieve and the dire need to respectfully get along during that process. Uh, Genesis chapter 50 verse 22 through 26 puts it this way. Yosef continued living in Egypt, he and his father's household. Yosef lived 110 years. Yosef lived to see Ephraim's great-grandchildren and the children of Manasseh, son, Manasseh's son, Machir, were born on Yosef's knees. Yosef said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely remember you and bring you up out of this land to the land which he swore to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Then Yosef took an oath from, his, from the sons of Yisrael. Quote, God will surely remember you, and you are to carry my bones up from here. So Yosef died at the age of 110, and they embalmed him and put him in a coffin in Egypt. So a few comments about this and a little bit of a conclusion. Yosef lived 110 years. He was blessed to meet his great-great-grandchildren from Ephraim, as well as those descended from Machir of Manasseh, an old Jewish tradition says 110 years of age is rather a perfect number of years, if you will. I, I personally see the blessed part of this in knowing your great-great-grandchildren. Wow. Well, beyond his passing, Yosef says twice, quote, God will remember you. God would both remember and save the Hebrews out of Egypt, as well as allow them to carry Yosef's bones back home. For now... Our unfinished story has Yosef embalmed and buried in Egypt. Well, we're going to take a look now at the Haftarah. Haftarah simply means the reading of the prophets after the Torah. And the, the prophetic reading that kind of fits herein is really about the transference of power, but it's in 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1-12. through 12. I'll go ahead and read it to you. It says... The time came near for David to die, and so he commissioned Shlomo, his son, as follows. I'm about to go, I mean, I'm going the way of all the earth. Therefore, be strong, show yourself a man. Observe the charge of Adonai, your God, to go in his ways and keep his regulations, his mitzvot, his commands, rulings and instructions in, ordinate, in accordance 
with all that was written in the Torah of Moshe, so that you will succeed in all that you in all you do and whatever you wherever you go. Pardon me, I'm stumbling all over this. If you do, Adonai will fulfill what he has promised to me when he said, If your children pay attention to how they live, conducting themselves before me honestly with all of their heart and being, you will never lack a man on the house, on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you are to be aware of what Joab, Joab the son of Teruah, did to me. That is what he did to to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Avner and Avner the son of Ner and Amasa the son of Yeter. He killed them, shedding the blood in the blood of war in peacetime, putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and the shoes on his feet. Therefore act according to your wisdom, don't let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the the uh, Giladi include them with those who eat at your table because they came and stood with me when I was fleeing from Av Shalom, your brother. Finally, you have with you Shemi, the son of Gerah the Benjamite uh, from Bakrim. He laid a terrible curse on me when I was on my way to uh, Makanaim, but he came down to me at the Jordan, so I swore to him by Adonai that I would not have him put to death with the sword. Now, however, you should not let him go unpunished. You are a wise man, and you will know what to do, what you should do with him. You will bring his gray head down to the grave with blood. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. David had ruled Israel for 40 years, 7 years in Hebron, and 33 years in Jerusalem. Shlomo sat at the throne of David his father, and, and his rule became firmly established. So that's the Haftarah reading. The beginning of a dynasty comes as kingly rule passes from father to son. Both David and Shlomo or Solomon reigned for a full 40-year generation, and this auspicious beginning does not come without its struggles, as David warns his son to beware of his enemies. So also the nation of Israel had and has seemingly insurmountable obstacles to, to hurdle, the Lord uh, being always near, even near enough to chastise if necessary. Understand, Israel is chastised by a father, Israel will be defended by that same father. So is there actually such a difference between ancient Israel and modern Israel? Or is the current situation simply the third commonwealth of Israel? Israel has been Israel ever since Israel began living more than merely existing. The people of Israel have seen four large-scale empires to scatter and subdue them, yet Israel has remained Israel quite unlike other ancient people groups. Sometimes I like to capitalize the, the L in life simply because there are two kinds of life, in Greek and in Hebrew. In Greek, bios or neos, those are two different kinds of life. Bios meaning more the manner of life that you live. You go to work, you come home, you sleep, you go to the bathroom, blah, blah, blah. While neos has to do more with a capital L life. In Hebrew, it's nefesh, being one kind of life, and Chai or Chaim being the other. King David's name has the numeric value of 14. Therefore, Matityahu or Matthew telescopes the generations into chunks of 14, from, from Avraham to David to Yekanyah, uh, pardon me, I don't know how to say his name in English, he kind of weighs, from Yekanyah to the Babylonian exile, and finally 14 generations to Yeshua himself. My point here is that exiles do not have, they have not caused Israel to cease to be Israel in any kind of way. Because, well, Am Israel Hai, Odavinu Hai. Israel loves because Israel's father, Israel lives because Israel's father lives. We're talking here about life. Those of us who mourn the passing of somebody those who us those of us who survive the survivors are the ones experiencing death those who go on are experiencing life 
Israel is experiencing life. Okay, Life is the substance that death seeks to bring down. Just as light is the substance that is sought after by darkness. But understand, darkness is merely a lack of light. In that same way, death is a lack of life. Okay? If you are experiencing anything short of the fullness of life, that means you're experiencing death trying to bring that life down. Okay? Death is an enemy to life. Death is not merely your body passing on. Death is not merely your body being put six feet under. Death is what we experience in this, this bios, in this daily, weekly existing. But you can have more than existence. When the Bible says, let us live and not die, it's talking about doing more than existing. It's talking about living. Okay. So what I want to communicate to you is what this parasha and the last two parashas are trying to communicate. Let's do more than exist. Let's not let death bring us, bring us down. Let's not allow it to rob life. Because death is merely a lack of life. Okay? Let's live. I mean, the, prayer, the parasha is called Vayakhi, literally meaning my life. And such a life it is, of course, eternal. Moreover, this eternal life beckons us each moment of each day. In your preserving, persevering faith, the genuineness of which is fiery trials, you are receiving what your trust is aiming at, namely, your deliverance. Your deliverance from all of this death trying to rob you from life. Okay? Cause those fiery trials to be something that can cause you to grow and thus attain more life. My friends, Vayakhi, may you live. Amen. Shalom.